So I remember I did a video a long time ago. I think it was back in 2015 when my dog Texas died. My wife and I got in Texas, uh, Tex, uh, the first year when we were together and he was with us for nine years. And one of the things that I said was hard when Tex passed was it wasn't just simply that he had died but it was also that there was a sorrow for the person that I had been who had died, right? As the years go by, we all change. But many times we don't really think about it. You know, one day leads into another, leads into another, leads into another. One small change in your personality builds on another, builds on another, builds on another. And then there's this point in your life where something, something very striking will happen, something like the loss of a pet or a loved one. And you're not only confronted with the death or the loss uh, of the, that person or thing, but you're also confronted with the reality that you are no longer who you used to be. It's not necessarily a bad thing. There's just a sorrow there. It's like when you graduate high school or you graduate college or you get promoted. These are good things, but as they are good things, it's also a sorrow because now you know you have to go on to the future and you have to leave what was behind. And I kind of think about that right now. And I think about, you know, for adults and for people, how many times the shackles, the shackles of our dead selves can keep us locked into a way of being that may possibly not serve us anymore. So, uh, so the Airstream, the Airstream, the Airstream is getting consigned off to Camping World. Uh, so shockingly, shockingly, I'm going to uh, give my Airstream to Camping World uh, and they are going to give me about $2,000 less than I paid for it. And apparently, they're gonna slap a price tag on it, about $14,000 more than I paid for it. So welcome to the modern world and the reality of supply chain issues. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so I dropped off the, the Airstream to get consigned, as the idea is. They put it onto their lot, uh, they show it, they have financing, they have all the ways to, to sell a product like an Airstream relatively easily. So basically, when they sell it, then I get a fixed, a fixed amount back, and we're all, we're all happy, we're happy except for the sorrow of losing the Airstream. And I think about that with Tex, right? Because I think there is the travel trailer part of my life, right? Tex, Tex passed away, Tex died in 2015. We got our first travel trailer about two months after that. And then that was, that was a period of life. And now that, that period of life is over. And it's not just for me, it's not just a period of life of the travel trailer being over, but it's also the period of life of where I think my wife and I thought thought the world was gonna go 12 years ago, right? Because we bought a big house, we bought a big house. Back, uh, back when we lived in Baltimore, we had lived in the city. We had been like that cool, yuppie couple. We had the, the, the cool little city townhouse that looked on the park that was in the cool area of town in Baltimore. And we decided that, uh, that you know, we were married, so it was probably time to, to think about the whole kids thing. So we bought the big house, the big ridiculous house. Let me tell you, don't do it, don't do it, do not do it. Anyways, we bought the big ridiculous house. That was beautiful, that was beautiful. We had a pond, we had a huge pond. I had a, you know, I had a, I had a deck, I had a deck that is bigger than some people's apartments, bigger than some people's houses here in Asheville. I had a thousand square foot deck. We lived on a beautiful amount of property. It's three acres. It was landscaped. We backed onto a 1900 acre park. It was just an absolutely beautiful thing. But, uh, but then the cancers, <laughs> but then the cancers, right? There is this, uh, this future that we thought that we were going into. And, uh, the spaghetti monster decided to tell us that, uh, no, that, <laughs> Whatever our plans were, they didn't matter. And so the interesting part there was, right? You know, so we bought this big house and then we, um, we thought we were going to have kids and then kids were off the table, but we had this 
big, beautiful house. And it was beautiful. It was amazing. It was this old, it was this barn. It was a 150-year-old barn that had been renovated into a house. We had done renovations on it to make it more ours. And, and it was like this weird thing. It was this weird feeling because it was such a special house. It was such a special place, but it didn't fit into our lives. And one of the reasons we kept living there for longer than we should have is because we knew we would never get that type of house again. We, it was like, it was 3,600, 4,000 square feet, usable space. When I say usable space, when you walked in, you looked up like two or three stories. You looked up 30 straight, straight feet in the middle area. And the thing was like every time we walked around, I was like, well, we know this house is too big. We know this house takes too much work. We know all of these things. But it's such a special house. It is a piece of art. We will never, ever buy anything like this again, right? And there was, there was a shackle to that. There was a shackle to this wonderful thing because it was so special and it was so unique. There was that hard part about trying to leave. That's something my wife and I dealt with a lot. But since we had this big place and all that, we got the travel trailer at one point, started traveling around the country quite a bit, and uh, we got the Airstream, love the Airstream. Again, Airstream, absolutely awesome, awesome little product right there. But one of the things with the Airstream is that in Maryland, I wanted to, to get away, I wanted to get out. I wanted to be on the road for a month at a time or two months at a time. Right again, before, before COVID, my wife and I traveled two to four months, damn near every single year. And then when COVID happened, all that got shut down. And we came here to Asheville. And we came here to Asheville. And that was the thing. That was like the, that was the, that was the breaking point for us with that big house. Is that, you know, when COVID happened, it just became, the issues became insurmountable. It was so lonely. It was so quiet. It required so much work. And when you can never leave, when you can never leave, when you can never basically get out of it, like... And Maryland shut down to the point that, um, that literally at one point, you know, I was going to the grocery store once a week. And when you got into the grocery store, you were literally told to get the hell out, like come in, buy everything you need and then leave. And so it was that break, it was that, it was that, there was that breaking point where it just became untenable to live in that house anymore. And we realized, and we realized that we could actually sell the house for some reason. We had not dropped into a horrible recession at that point. And so it was a breaking point for us to be able to leave and come down here to Asheville. And life is, life is so much better down here in Asheville. We have more friends down here in Asheville. We have much more of a life down here in Asheville. And I can actually create my little Silicon Dojo business down in Asheville. This is so much better of an environment than where we lived for 10 years. But for so long, we didn't leave where we were because there was that, you know, shackled, shackled to the dead carcass of who you thought you were going to be, or possibly for even who you were. Right? I think about this now with uh, the travel trailer, right? So the Airstream now going down to camping world, being consigned. And the thing is with the travel trailer, I love the travel trailer. And I have loved my time on the road. I've uh, done multiple months going out to Banff. Did a month and went out to, to the West, to Moab, and that type of thing. We spent nine months on the road in 2015. We spent many more months, right? I spent a, a chunk, a decent amount of uh, the past seven years or whatever uh, in, in a travel trailer of some sort. Uh, but the interesting thing is, like with a travel trailer, with a travel trailer, you have to have a truck. <laughs> You just simply have to have a truck. You cannot, you cannot tow an Airstream with a Chevy Bolt. Just not gonna happen, right? And so the interesting thing is, like, so I was sitting there and with my wife and with me, we're talking about it, and we realized we don't wanna go. We don't wanna go for a month at a time. I have zero, I have zero interest in leaving Asheville for a month. Right? And if there's anywhere I really want to go with the travel trailer, Rocky Mountain National Park, I still want to get to that. Big Bend National Park, I still want to get to that. You know, it's like three days of towing trailer. Three days of towing the trailer. One way. One way, it's three days. And I started talking to my wife about it. And I'm like, well, if I did want to go, I do want to at some point, but if I want to go to Rocky Mountain National Park, if I want to go to Big Bend, I can hop on an airplane. I can be there at the end of the day. So literally, so literally, 
I can hop on there. I can, I can go to the national park and be back in less time than it would take to tow the trailer. And again, that sounds much more reasonable. Five, six, maybe seven days to go off and see something amazing. I'm all for leaving Asheville for that amount of time. But the idea of leaving for weeks and weeks or months, right? My life has changed, right? My life in Baltimore out in those exurbs was lonely. Again, an, inter an interesting thing to think about in the modern materialistic world. Would you rather be in something beautiful or not be lonely? Again, I think, I think that's one of the big issues we have in a modern society is we have so many pretty things that we don't have anybody to share them with, right? Again, it's one of those, it's one of those things um, to think about. But anyway, so, so here, like again, it's, it's a great place. And so sitting there, looking at the trailer, don't want to go for weeks. And then, then I'm, and the, the issue from that then is, again, we, we pay, so we pay for the insurance. We pay for the insurance for the trailer. Uh, we have to pay for a storage space for the trailer. Uh, and then beyond that, then we have the truck, right? Again, as I was saying, they, the, the truck, we have, to, we have to have an F-150. Essentially, we have to have an F-150 to tow this trailer. An F-150 gets 20 miles or less to the gallon. Um, an F-150 is huge. It's a big vehicle. Now, to be clear, out west or in the exurbs, that's not really a big deal. Uh, but again, we live in Asheville, so the city, the city that we're in, um, you know, having a big-ass vehicle is a complete pain in the ass. And it's just, it's just more than I need. It's just this huge beast of a vehicle. But I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about it. So I've had the, I've had the truck now for seven or eight years. And it's like, okay, well, it's reasonable. It's reasonable to, to trade in the truck to get a, a, a vehicle that's more appropriate to where we live. But, but we've got a trailer. But we've got a trailer. If I get a Chevy Bolt or I get a Tesla or if I get a Mustang E or if I get the plug-in hybrid escape, Ford plug-in hybrid escape, I like those a lot. Uh, the fact of the matter is those can't tow a trailer. So I can't, I can't get rid of the truck because I've got this trailer Right? And then one of the interesting things to think about this is how your situation and the possessions that you have mold you, mold you slowly in ways that you may not think about, right? Because again, Asheville is relatively small, blah, blah, blah. But again, parking spaces are relatively small. So one of the interesting things to be thinking about with the truck is the truck is so big and the truck is such a pain in the ass to park. That there are many things that I might do, but I just sit there and I'm like, well, well, it's going to be a pain to drive the truck to where I'm going and then to find a parking space. I'm like, oh, that would, be, that would be a cool thing to do. There's this music thing in the middle of town, or there's this, this, or that. But if I have to drive the truck there, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a parking space for the truck. Not that I can't find a parking space, but can I can't find a parking space for the truck. Then I don't know. If it's going to be a pain in the ass, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a parking space. Well, maybe I won't do that thing. And then think about that. That kind of, that kind of decision. What happens when you make that kind of decision one day after another day after another day, a month after a month after a month after a month? How, how much detriment is there to your life because you make a decision because the material items that you have are based of a life that you used to have and because you haven't given up being shackled to that corpse of who you used to be, then that corpse is now haunting your present reality. I don't know. It's one of those, it's one of those weird things to think about as I get older. Um, Cause I feel like, I don't know. I look at my parents' generation the actual boomers. To be clear, I'm not a boomer. I'm a Gen Xer. The fact that Gen Xers get called boomers is amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> For all the wrong reasons. But anyways, right? I, I'm a Gen Xer. But, but I look at the boomer generation. And the boomer generation seemed much more A to B. At least from what I can tell. 
right? You graduate high school, you go to college, you get married, you get a job, you get a small house, you get a bigger house, you get a big house. And then, I don't know, like 60 or 70 or something, you get a smaller house or you go into an old folks home. It's like there's more, seem much more of just a continuum. You just keep going. I think the interesting thing for, for the younger generation, though, the Gen Xers, is that the world really is changing so much now. Right, like that within our generation, like like my wife and I talk about this, how we both used to have our book collections that we were so proud of, right? Because that that was a thing. Having libraries full of books used to be a status symbol. It showed how well read you were, how smart you were. It showed, it showed the world, it showed anybody that came into your house, the types of books that you read. It was such a, it was such a big thing, uh, whether it was books or whether it was VHS tapes, VHS tapes back in the day, cassettes, records, eight tracks, right? All this kind of stuff for, for years and years and years, 100 years, 100 years of the American life, there were, there were these items of content Again, whether there were books, or whether there were DVDs, or these items of content, and you would create libraries, and that showed the world what you cared about. But the important thing with this, too, is that you needed enough room for these libraries of things. If you have five bookshelves full of books, you need room in your house or your apartment for five bookshelves worth of books. You know, people all don't think about this. Air conditioning their books, climate controlling these status items. But anyways, they're an important thing. But one of the interesting things, you know, over the past 10 years, really not, maybe maybe 15, maybe 15, is how these items, these physical items that used to be so important, now basically no longer exist, right? With a book, you can read from your Kindle. Uh, with uh, with music, right? I, I have uh, I have Apple Music or whatever. Somebody gave me a CD. It was interesting. Somebody gave me a CD, and I crap you not. It was funny because our brand new Ford plug-in hybrid vehicle, very awesome vehicle, that has almost everything. Almost there was like one additional thing we could have gotten to it, but almost everything you get to it. It literally does not have a CD player at all. If I wanted a collection of CDs, my biggest problem would be figuring out how to play the damn things at this point, right? So there are no, the physical books are gone. The, the, the CDs and eight tracks and the, 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 the records are gone. Uh, movies, again, why have collections of DVDs or VHS tapes or whatever uh, when you have your Netflix or your, your iTunes or, or whatever like that? I know some people will argue with that, but for most of us, right, iTunes or Netflix or whatever is fine. But the interesting part with that to think about is that then means you need less physical space. If you don't have all these books, if you don't have all these status items, because they're now irrelevant, then all the area for those status items no longer needs to exist. And I think about this too, like with things like Lyft, right? With Lyft or Uber, whether or not they survive, because, but it's becoming practical for some people to give up their cars. I don't think it's as practical as Uber and Lyft try to pretend it to be, but it's practical enough. Um, Right? Depending on, yeah. And so, and so that's one of the things to be thinking about is like, do you, do, if, if you have a couple and you live in a town, especially like Asheville, do you need a two car garage or do you need two parking spaces? Do you need the space for your library? As internet connections, as internet connections has changed so much, so many of us can literally work from anywhere. One of the reasons that the housing market in Asheville is absolutely exploding is because people uh, that work in San Diego, that have San Diego jobs, are now able to work in Asheville and get paid the San Diego rate for what they're doing. And New York. So many New Yorkers in Asheville. It's like cockroaches, right? But what's amazing with our world, though, is I think for our generation and the younger generations, so much is changing 
that allows us to dramatically change literally how we live, right? I, I look at it with my father. My father was a PhD industrial safety engineer, right? He was really good at, at what he does. Um, but the thing was like for him, he only had so many decision points, right? Uh, because he, I mean, as his PhD, what he did, he, he had to work for the academic institution or basically he had to work for a government facility, which means there had to be a facility uh, that actually had a job that, that he wanted to take. Uh, he would have to live within a physical commuting area of whatever that particular facility was. So, I mean, he had some flexibility, a bigger house or a smaller house, some of the accoutrements that come with the house. Uh, does he want to live more in town or more in the suburbs? But it wasn't like my father could ever you know ever just pick everything up and just go to El Paso you can never just pick everything up and just literally go to the middle of the mountain somewhere because he still had you know work and so that's that's what I wonder nowadays with so many of us as we're moving ahead as we're putting one foot in front of the other are we making decisions based off of our current situations and our current circumstance and what is appropriate and will make us happiest and healthiest now? Or are we making decisions based off of our past? And can we, and can we give up? the past. Again, you look at something like a possession. That's what I always hate, right? In the modern world, in the modern world, snarky, snarky has become a badge of honor. Be snarky about everything. Oh, ho, ho, ho. possessions are nothing. But they are. But they are. They are status symbols. They are they are they are, they are tools that allow you to do what you want to do. And they may be relatively irreplaceable. They may be re irreplaceable as you could not afford them again. They could be irreplaceable as they will never be never be created again. So you couldn't buy one even if you had a million dollars. Uh, or they may be irreplaceable of just you just know you would never make that decision again. If you had that same amount of money in your hand and you had multiple options, you would simply pick a different option. Right. And so we get tied. We get tied to things like an airstream. Right? An airstream is a very <laughs> brutally expensive. Item. Again, to be clear, they are going to be charging fourteen thousand dollars more than I paid for it. You can kind of do the numbers on how much an airstream goes for, right? And so, like, when I'm giving up the airstream, not only not only is it I'm giving up a travel trailer. Right? You can buy a travel trailer for ten thousand dollars. Whatever. Write a check. Ten thousand dollars can buy a travel trailer. But like, when if the airstream, the airstream is such Thing. And to know when I'm giving it up, that I'm giving that, that I would not make that decision again. And then when you think about the decisions that come after that decision. So once, once the Airstream is sold, one of the big things is then to replace my normal vehicle. So that's more reasonable for my day to day life. Again, I may literally get a, give a, get a Chevy Bolt. If you want to know the type of human being I really am, I truly may go from an F 150 Super Cab to a Chevy Bolt. Again, to be clear, the vehicle does not make the man, the man makes the vehicle. If you need any kind of vehicle to feel like you're a man, that's yeah, right, but again, like for me, I look at what's most appropriate. A Chevy, a Chevy Bolt can get like 220, 230 miles on a charge. It's a relatively small vehicle that you can get around town. Uh, it's surprisingly inexpensive for a lot of the accoutrements you get. You get you get wireless Apple Play in there. But here's the thing, right? Again, we think about we think about the death the death knell for a lifestyle. So, okay, I get rid of the Airstream. But while I still have the F-150, theoretically, I could just go out and buy another travel trailer if I really wanted to, right? That's still, there's still that possibility. There's still that possibility of going back to that lifestyle. But then when I get rid of the truck, right, the next thing to go will be the truck. If I get something like a Chevy Bolt, <laughs> Chevy Bolt is not going to be towing an Airstream, just how it is, right? And so then with that decision, that will then completely close this chapter of life. 
And that can just be a sorrowful thing. I thought it was really interesting. Way back when, way back when, when I was traveling through India. So I spent four months and I backpacked through India, uh, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka. And I had to travel with a buddy, a buddy of mine. Uh, so I met her in Darjeeling. We went up through the Sikkim province uh, back you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and then we did the Annapurna circuit in Nepal. And uh, I think she was a Cambridge graduate. She was either a Cambridge or an Oxford graduate. I don't know. Fancy school I could never get into. But it was really interesting. So I was sitting there and she had graduated with a philosophy degree. And one of the things that I asked her is I was like, so, so are you going to go back and get your master's degree at whatever it was, Oxford or Cambridge? Um, and she said, no, uh, almost definitely not. And I was like, oh, really? I would figure that was a good school. If you got a good, you know, undergraduate education, I would think that you would want to go and you would get a graduate education there. And she said, no, no, that's, that's not the problem. Uh, the thing is, is they gener generally will not allow you to get a graduate degree if you graduated from their undergraduate program. And I was, I was talking to her. I was like, what? That seems weird. She said, you know, if you're exceptional or if there's a real reason that you should continue on that particular school, they'll allow it. But in general, what those universities want to force their students to do is to go out into the world and have new experiences to create themselves anew, right? If you're, if you're really good in high school and then you get into one of these prominent universities, Right, going through that university comes with a lot of prestige, comes with a lot of pumps, comes with a lot of circumstance. That's the type of thing it gets very comfortable to get attached to, right? Okay, I, it, it was really hard when I was in high school, but now I got here, I feel like I have self-worth, I feel like I'm important, the whole nine yards. And so it's very easy for a lot of people to then wanna get their, their master's degrees and their PhDs at the exact same university where they got their undergraduate degree because they can, ju they can just keep on that continuum. But I thought it was interesting, again, Cambridge or Oxford, I don't know, either or, whatever, wherever she went, their, their concept was actually that you should break that, that you should force the students for their graduate degrees to go somewhere else so they get that different experience, meet the different people there, and grow in an entirely different way. And that's a way that this kind of thing can be forced. So, yeah, I don't know. There you go. There you go. Some pondering today from Eli the computer guy as the trailer as the trailer goes away. I mean it was it's because it is interesting too. We'll talk about this later, but I was thinking about that with Asheville. Because my wife uh, my wife had another cancer scare. So if you're new to the show, my wife has had three cancers at this point. Thyroid cancer, had a thyroidectomy, breast cancer, had a double mastectomy, uh, skin cancer, took a friggin' chunk out of her back. Um, and so, you know, cancer, like, saying a cancer scare. Some people say cancer scares, and like, eh, when she says cancer scare, right? Anyway, she had a cancer scare. Who knows, who knows? She has lymph nodes. She has lymph nodes that are bigger than they should be. She went to the doctor, they did the ultrasound. <laughs> And if you've ever de dealt with the whole cancer process in the American medical system, yeah, who knows? Uh, is it not cancer? Eh, they can't say that. Is it cancer? Well, probably not. Probably not, so it isn't cancer? No, we're not saying it isn't cancer. So is it cancer? We don't know if it is cancer. Anyway, but one of the interesting things I, I found for myself, and that's one... I really decided it was time for the Airstream uh, to go, is that I realized, even if she did die, right, even if she did get the cancer and all that, that I like Asheville, that I don't want to go on the road. That was the thing. Like, we were in Baltimore, and I had to worry about her dying. It was like, fuck it, fuck it. If my wife dies, putting the dog in the travel trailer, selling the house for whatever it'll go for, and we're going on the road, right? The interesting thing is, being here in Asheville, it's like, man, man, I don't really want to leave Asheville. <laughs> got friends in Asheville, got breweries in Asheville, got a little soil condojo thing going in Asheville. If my wife dies, it'll suck, it'll suck. 
I don't I don't want to I don't want to leave leave Asheville. My life has changed. It's not the same thing. So anyways, there we go. Some things to be thinking about. What in your life? What possessions in your life are holding you to where you are? And has it come, time come, for you to move on past whatever that life was? Again, like I say, like, like books. Books used to be a status symbol. It was hard. Years ago, when my wife and I got the Kindles, we got the candle, the Kindles. We realized how worthless physical books were. And so we, we, we had to ship out all the books. Two libraries, personal libraries with the books, ended up going to the library. And that was hard because like it was a status. It was a stat. But, but, but how are people supposed to know we'd be smart if they don't see books? Right? It's hard to give up what was. <clears throat> but how can your life be better if you don't let go of what no longer serves you? And all, all the possessions you have that are there to serve somebody that you no longer are, all the things that you do to serve somebody that's no longer here, how does that then become a detriment to your current life? If you can't give up on who you used to be, are you making who you are so much worse? Something to think about. Something to think about. And if Camping World is willing to consign your uh, your, uh, your your travel trailer, you might think about doing it now. Uh, we are going to go into a recession. The economy is going to go to hell. So if you have an Airstream to sell, this might be the time. So anyways, that's all. That is all I have to ponder today. Um, I don't know. See you guys around in the next video. Uh, do remember, Silicon Dojo is currently my pride and joy. SiliconDojo.com. Authority list, gatekeeper list, free to the end user, hands-on technology education here in Asheville, North Carolina. Literally tomorrow, in my timeline, literally tomorrow, in less than 24 hours, I'm teaching the first class. Uh, so we're going forward with this. Uh, if you're interested in Silicon Dojo, go to SiliconDojo.com. If you like the idea of free to the end user education, do remember, that's not actually free. <laughs> Somebody has to pay for it. Somebody does have to pay for it. Uh, office space costs money. Computers cost money. Employees. Employees. <laughs> oh, if I am ever so cursed as to have employees again, they cost a lot of money. Oh my God. God, employees are so expensive. They make an Airstream look like a freaking dollar dollar store item. Uh, but anyways, uh, so if you want to throw if you want to throw a couple of dollars in, there's a link I think down on the doobly doos, uh, and there is a link on SiliconDojo.com if you want to support that type of thing. Uh, and with that, see y'all later. Oh, my poor Airstream. I hope. I hope my Airstream isn't scared with all the other RV kitties. <laughs>